Today's scripture reading is from Job 2, 1 to 10. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incite me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, church. It's very good to be here with you again today. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, for this month, we uh, first of all, I'd like to th- thank the worship team, though. Thank you for, for leading us in worship and for Chris for reading the, uh, the scripture for us today as well. Um, this month, we'll be continuing with the series on the book of Job. It's been a while since we've looked at Job. Last, we left Job at the end of chapter one, um, when he had been informed by four messengers of four consecutive losses beginning with his holdings in livestock and the servants that were assigned to their care in chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. The livestock had been stolen, and the servants were put to the sword. Eventually, in the fourth loss, his ten children were tragically killed when a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house in which they were feasting, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Well, what was most significant and striking about the account was Job's consistent response to his sudden misfortunes. First, remember, he stood to his feet. He tore his ornate robe. He shaved his head bald. He fell to the ground. And fifth, he worshipped the Lord, his God. Chapter 1, verse 20. We noted last time that this represented Job's outward expression, his outward response to his many losses. Those present with him at the time who observed his outward response would have understood its significance. We too must understand what it means. Who assumes a humble posture of worshipful submission to God when engulfed by grief and catastrophic losses, such as those that Job had sustained? Now, his spoken response was equally as unusual and exceptional. Exceptional. The words that proceeded from his mouth were these, Naked, I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Chapter 1, verse 21. It's no wonder that the Lord had said earlier to the Satan in the heavenly council chamber, Have you considered... My servant Job, there was no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and turns away from evil. Who utters such words after hearing what he had heard? Well, his heart response is also summed up for us in the final statement of the chapter. 
In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Chapter 1, verse 22. So in each aspect of Job's testing in chapter 1, Satan is proved wrong. Job did not curse God to his face, as he alleged he would. Job's integrity, his yashar, remains intact, untouched by anything that would diminish it. Maintaining his yashar, Job's way of life conforms to what is right. He continues to be righteous. And he continues to follow the Lord's ways, his ethical and moral standards of behavior. But Job's testing does not end with the losses of, his, of all he possessed. Another test is about to descend upon, upon the man of, from us, one that would strip him of his dignity, bring him into disrepute, and ravage his body with acute pain and suffering. Together, the two tests will lead to further losses, including his honor, respect, and standing in the community to which he belonged, as well as treasured friendships and even the support from his own wife. Will he eventually capitulate to the adversary's schemes by cursing God and submitting to his application for maid, medical assistance, and dying? Well, today we'll be considering chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And we can follow that story using this simple outline. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. The adversary challenges the Lord again over Job's integrity, verses 1 through 5. Second, the adversary is permitted to afflict Job's body, verses 6 and 7. Third, Job is afflicted and responds accordingly, verses 8, 9, and 10. So we'll look at the adversary challenges the Lord again over Job's integrity. Next slide, please. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, as they did in chapter 1. And Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth and going back and forth on it. This second presentation of the angels, they're called angels in the New International, in the English Standard Version, and a few other translations, they're called the sons of God. Before the Lord in the heavenly council is mostly, but not completely, identical to the one described in chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. The differences are significant, though, to the context of the unfolding story. The original crucial question asked by Satan in chapter 1, does Job fear God for nothing? Though unspoken, it remains. His second appearance is, is for the same reason as before, to demolish the Lord's confidence in his servant Job and his expectation that humans would revere and worship him for who he is and not merely in exchange for the benefits they receive in return. As though the service of God were an agreed upon arrangement involving corresponding obligations to God and to people. Well, next, again the Lord refer, affirms Job's integrity, verse 3. Nonetheless, the Lord has not budged in showing off his showcase um, and showcasing his servant Job. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my, so my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and turns away from evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. This was a new um, statement coming from the mouth of the Lord. He still maintains his integrity. So the Lord affirms, despite his heavy losses, that Job had not compromised his integrity, even though Satan had incited him to permit his ruin. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, Satan had incited King David to take a census, which he did. Here, the Lord turns the words of the adversary against him, though you have incited me against him to ruin him without any reason at all. Next, we'll look at verses 4 and 5. Again, the adversary challenges Job's integrity. Satan replies, skin for skin, 
A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Here's the essence of temptation. Satan wagered that Job would give up his integrity, his reverence and respect for God, if his body is severely afflicted. The Satan has accused the Lord of keeping a protective hedge around Job. Here he suggests that wealth was like a shield or a garment of leather over his human skin, in a sense. He implied that Job was, was not hurt by these dreadful calamities because all he cared about really was himself. Next we'll look at verses 6 and 7. The adversary is permitted to afflict Job's body. Again, the Lord accepts the adversary's challenge. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. At this point in the narrative, God has handed over to Satan virtually everything pertaining to Job's well-being. In chapter 1, he handed over everything belonging to Job. Now in chapter 2, he hands over Job himself for the adversary to afflict him as he pleases. So Satan has managed, by the express permission of the Lord, to take Job from the pinnacle of societal standing as the greatest man among all the people of the East, chapter 1, verse 3, indeed as one without peer in all the earth, chapter 2, verse 3, to complete financial bankruptcy, the loss of family, and physical agony. Well, we find him in chapter 2, now in the hands of the adversary, the Satan, with only one restriction on the exercise of his power. While he could afflict his flesh and bones, he could not take his life. Killing Job would prove nothing. Making him suffer up to, but not beyond the point of death, would prove either God or Satan right, and the other wrong. We'll look at verse 7 next. Again, the adversary afflicts Job, but this time with painful sores. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. I remember many years ago when I went to Bible college, I was excited to be learning about the scriptures for the first time in my life. And uh, I was studying in Three Hills, Alberta. In my sophomore year, it was Christmas time, and I went home for Christmas vacation uh, about eight days before Christmas that year. As soon as I arrived home, I began to feel unwell. And very quickly, uh, it was apparent that I had contracted chicken pox. And literally, from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head, I was covered in somewhat painful sores. No, I'm sure they weren't as painful as, as Job's were, but I spent my, those two weeks mostly in bed, just recovering from chicken pox. And as it neared to the time to return to school, my sores were healing and I was almost better, so I took the train and I returned to, uh, to school in time uh, for the classes to resume. But here in verse 7, we hear the last reference to Satan in the entire book. He went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with these painful sores that covered his whole body. The phrase, from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head, signifies the totality of the covering. It was the worst that Satan could do to Job. Now it's unclear and unknown the exact nature of the skin disease itself. However, we have some indications later in the book. In chapter 7, verse 5, Job complains bitterly, My body is clothed with worms and scabs. My skin is broken and festering. Chapter 30, verse 30, he moans, My skin groans black and peels. My body burns with fever. In chapter 2, verse 12, which we have here, and in chapter 19, verses 19 and 20, he talks of extreme weight loss, a repulsive appearance, characterized by signs of his, they characterize the signs of his infliction. When his friends first lay eyes on him, chapter 2, verse 12, he was barely recognizable to them. He would later exclaim, I am nothing but skin and bones, chapter 19, verse 20. 
And finally, in uh, chapter 19, 14, all would turn away from him in disgust and avoid him at all costs. He said, my relatives have gone away. My closest friends have forgotten me. So it was a time of deep suffering for, for this man, Job, from the land of Uz. The loss of loved ones, debilitating and fatal illnesses, personal betrayals, financial reversals, and moral failures. No one is immune. No one is immune. Human life is fatally fragile and subject to forces that are beyond our power to manage. Timothy Keller says, life is tragic. Well, we'll move into uh, the third and, and final point. Job is afflicted and responds accordingly. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. We'll begin with Job's condition. In verse 8, he scrapes himself and sits among the ashes. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Now the ashes is really soil or earth. He's sitting on, 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 the, on the ground and, and it's a position of, of, of great demoralization and, 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 uh, and suffering. His outward response was utterly pitiful. This great, greatest man of all the people in the East had been reduced to the most pathetic and despicable. But that characterization will depend on the attitude of the observer. You've heard the expression, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. What is most pathetic and despicable in the eyes of one may actually arouse pity, compassion, and mercy in the eyes of another. Fortunately, our God, we're told, I believe it's in James chapter 5, verse 11, our God is full of compassion and he's full of mercy. He views things differently. In any case, the former hero from us now sits among ashes as he takes this piece of broken clay pot and scrapes himself with it in an effort to alleviate his suffering. The fragment of discarded pottery, a potsherd, illustrates the commonness of this once uncommon man, the insignificance of him who had once been most significant, and the fragility of a human life once far removed from the plight of the ordinary. In fact, the masking of the commonness and insignificance of clay pots in the ancient world is actually associated with an evil heart, as in Proverbs 26, verse 23. Like a coating of silver dross on an earthenware, on earthenware are fervent lips with an evil heart. So perhaps he was viewed that way by others. This man must have, must have an evil heart. Look at his condition. He has been reduced to nothing more than a broken piece of pottery. Well, more than anything, Job is in the classic position of a mourner. Doesn't, doesn't, didn't Jesus say, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted? In, uh, when Pastor Bill was here speaking to us from the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We're going to find that as we continue through the book. He who had been accustomed to sumptuous surroundings had now become a dweller in the ashes, or among the ashes. There are some other instances of ashes in the scriptures. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 19, and this is horrible, after having been raped by her brother Amnon, King David's daughter Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornate robe that she was wearing. She put her hands on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went in the depths of her suffering. In Esther chapter 4, verse 1, when Mordecai the Jew learned that Haman, the enemy of the Jews, had planned to destroy his people, living in the Persian Empire under King Xerxes, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and he went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. And in Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, when Daniel pleaded with the Lord for his people, he did so in prayer and petition, in fasting, in sackcloth, and in ashes. Church, sometimes we too need to be clothed in ashes 
and when we cry out to God for um, the situations that we encounter and how, uh, how the, the state of the world today even. Now the last words that Job speaks at the end of the book is also the word ashes. Listen to the last word spoken by Job, chapter 42, verse 6. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Well, we'll look next at how he reasons rhetorically with his wife. This is a difficult passage to, for anyone to consider uh, because we can, we can take it in many ways. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Job replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? The English Standard Version says, shall we accept good from God and shall we, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive a, a evil? Shall we not receive evil? Job recognized that what he was receiving was essentially evil. And I think when the Lord taught his disciples how to pray, the, the disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. He told them, pray this way. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. So here Job's wife speaks for the first and the very last time in the book. Job only mentions her twice in discourse. In chapter 19, verse 17, he complains that in his wretched condition, in, in uh, 1917, he complains that his breath was loathsome, even to his wife. And in chapter 31, verse 10, he vows that he had, if he had ever been unfaithful to her, and he had not, she too would be free to go to another man rather than to remain with him. Again, he's underscoring his integrity, that he would, he would re retain and maintain at all costs. But she too has suffered the loss of all their assets and income. She too had to live without her 10 children. And it appeared that very soon she would be losing her husband too. Our hearts ought to go out to her with the same compassion and mercy we would embrace and comfort Job. Or that God would embrace and, and comfort Job. After all, they were one flesh. Genesis 2:24. So his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. This is exactly what Satan, the Satan, the adversary, alleged that Job would do. He would curse God and die. And it seems as though her own voice, her own statement seems to uh, further the um, intent of the adversary. But Job will maintain his integrity throughout the trial that he is undergoing. He contends in his own defense, I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my innocence and I will never let it go. This is from chapter 27, verses 5 and 6. She probably believed, along with others, or possibly believed, that all wrongdoing deserves a corresponding punishment. And that's the under, underlying belief system that was prevalent at that time. And I'm afraid that we have that belief system circulating amongst us all today too, that if somebody is, is suffering greatly, there must be some underlying um, culpability on the part of that person to deserve such, a, uh, such an outcome in life. If Job would only curse God, he would die, bringing his suffering to a swift conclusion. Perhaps this is what she was thinking. Well, there's no indication that Job and his wife were Israelites, subject to the law of Moses. The penalty of cursing God and blaspheming God is death by stoning, according to Leviticus chapter 24. Let's listen to this, uh, verses 15 and 16. Say to the Israelites, anyone who curses their God will be held responsible. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. The entire assembly must stone him, whether foreigner or native born, when he blasphemes the name, he is to be put to death. 
So this was the, this was the um, outcome, the consequence for cursing God and blaspheming him. Well, Job, rebu- Job does rebuke his wife for her remarks, but I think he does it gently. I do think he does it gently. Of course he must maintain his integrity, and of course he would not curse God in order to bring a swift end to his suffering. His reasoning reverberates down through the ages as one of the wisest rhetorical questions ever uttered. Shall we accept good from God and not affliction? Or as the English Standard Version mentions, I said, shall we not also receive evil? The word order in the original Hebrew script reads as follows. The good shall we accept from God and the trouble, the affliction, the evil, shall we not accept? I can hear these words from the Fiddler, Fiddler on the Roof, the, the play and the movie from many years ago. Um, and I can hear them on the lips of Tevya, spoken to his wife, Goldie. Shall we not, shall we receive good from the Lord, Goldie, and shall we not receive evil? A very Jewish, Semitic way of, of, uh, of thinking. But there are wise words spoken here by our hero from us. Jesus affirmed as much as well when he said, in this world, you will have trouble, you will have affliction, and you will experience evil. But take heart, I have overcome the world, John 16, 31. Jesus has overcome the world. Aren't Aren't you grateful for that? I am. But we must not let our troubles trouble us too much. He also said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. John 14, 27. And there's a reason for that. We're going to come to that uh, shortly. There's a reason why we need not be troubled, overly troubled and, and uh, frightened. The Lord Jesus has not promised us a trouble-free life. But he does give us his peace to rid us of hearts that are trouble-free, filled, trouble-filled. And we need not fear when we find ourselves in troubling circumstances. As we are told in Psalm 23, even though we pass through the darkest valley, valley, even the valley of the shadow of death, we need not fear evil. For he, the good shepherd, is with us, his rod and his staff. They comfort us. God comes to us and he comforts us, as he will to Job. Job's steadfast trust in God, even when his circumstances appear to be hopeless, is ours to adopt, to appropriate, to also have that steadfast uh, trust in God. I believe it's in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with joy, and peace as you trust in him, so that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's as though Job knew also what we understand today from reading 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Here are these words. For our light and momentary troubles, our afflictions, are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's where we need to fix our our vision, our sights. Well, next we'll look at how Job maintains his integrity in not sinning with his words, the final um, statement or the final words of of our uh, text for today. In all this, in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. He did not sin in what he said. How easily it is for us to sin in what we say. How easily it is for me to sin with my words through my lips. Job did not blame God for the fiery trial he found himself in for no apparent reason. This is important to note. He was convinced that he was not being punished for wrongdoing because he knew he had done nothing wrong. Others didn't know that, but he knew that. At the same time, he couldn't explain why he was suffering such immense loss for no apparent reason. 
Nonetheless, he would continue to do what he'd always done. He would hope in God. He would later say in chapter 13, verse 15, Though he slay me, even then, yet I will hope in him. That was his posture. That was his attitude of heart. Now to end, the psalmist who composed two psalms, the first two tom- psalms of book two in the, in the Psalter. Book two begins with Psalm 42. And, the, and Psalm 43 was probably at one time together, united together with Psalm 42. There we're left with a recurring refrain in uh, three verses, verses 5 and 11 of, of Psalm 42 and verse 5 of Psalm 43. It's what we ought to say to ourselves whenever we're brought low by affliction, troubles, agonizing circumstances. And are the, these are the words, my soul, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is self-talk that we ought to appropriate, and we can take these words into our own souls and express them to ourselves. We can speak these words to ourselves. Well, we'll end today with a, a bit of a review of the three Ps that I introduced back on January 14th when we looked at the first five verses of, of Job chapter 1. The, first, the three Ps are profitability, promise, and prospect. First, the profitability of endurance. We looked at Romans chapter 15, verse 4, the first portion. For everything, and I brought my Bible up, everything that is written in the scriptures, everything that was written in the past in God's word, the Bible, was written to teach us for our learning so that through the endurance of the scriptures, first of all, the endurance of the scriptures, we learn endurance through the scriptures as we read and as we practice not being just doer, hearers of the word only, but doers of the word, we learn endurance. We learn to be steadfast. We learn to be perseverant, as Job was. But it's through the scriptures that that's, that, that takes place. And it's profitable. Um, James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or endurance. Endurance and perseverance are one and the same. They're just different English words translating the Greek. Let perseverance or endurance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything at all. James 1, 2 to 4. Second, we'll find as we go through the book of Job and as we live life according to the words of, of, of God, the promise of encouragement, the promise of encouragement for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance of the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, there's much encouragement for us in the Bible if we'll read it, if we'll take it into our souls, into our hearts and minds. It's encouraging. And we'll come more to that. We'll, uh, another synonym of encouragement is comfort. They're, they comfort us, just as the, the shepherd's rod and staff comfort the, uh, the sheep that is in uh, distress, Psalm 23. Third, the prospect of hope. There's a prospect of hope. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance of the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. We might have hope. So that brings us back to uh, the refrain from Psalm 42 and far, Psalm 43. Ask ourselves, ask yourself, why, my soul, are you troubled? Why, my soul, you're downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. Uh, next, so, thank you. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him my Savior, and my God. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for 
Thank you for giving us the uh, endurance that we need, the, the perseverance and steadfastness that we need for life, our life in Christ in this world. Uh, thank you for, um, for the uh, scriptures that help us to, to become people of perseverance and steadfastness. Thank you for your encouragement, for your steadfast encouragement of us. And thank you for the hope that lies before us, a hope that, is, that can never be uh, taken away from us. We give you thanks and we, we bless you and we praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen.